Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile. Okay, so he hello everyone. Uh, it's lovely to have you and uh, have you join me for the next uh, next 40 minutes or so. So the subject of the webinar is why don't people just do what you ask? Um, so in other words, whether you are a, a manager or whether you're a leader or just in everyday life really, uh, sometimes you ask people to do something for you, they seem to say yes, um, or you can't really understand why they wouldn't help you, and yet things don't turn out as you expected. Maybe they don't do what you've asked at all, maybe they do something different than you asked, um, and it's confusing, it's confusing why people just don't do the simple things. Of course there's an obvious reason, there's a very obvious reason why people don't do what you ask, because they don't listen. Because of course if we assume that you are perfect, you, uh, you really think carefully about your plans, you think about what you need, uh, and, and you, uh, when you ask somebody to help you or to do something for you, uh, you communicate that very clearly. So obviously the problem must be with them, they don't listen, they don't understand, they have some other agenda, something like that. Um, and that's the simple explanation. Because it's the simple explanation, it's what most people think. So most people, when, uh, when they're in this kind of situation, they're confused. Because I communicated perfectly, therefore the problem must be with the other person. Of course, on the other hand, maybe they just didn't hear you. And I don't mean hear you as in listening or heard the sound of your voice. What I mean is, maybe you didn't communicate what you thought you did. So, as you know, what we're going to talk about during this webinar is three things, really. We're going to talk about how people interpret instructions, and, uh, and that's very interesting because people don't interpret instructions always the way that we expect them to. So, once we've understood that, we can learn how we can package instructions, how we can word or phrase instructions so that they're easier for people to follow. And then of course you can add some extra uh, emphasis to that by using your communication skills, which you already have, uh, to help you to get the results that you want. There's a very important point to bear in mind here. For any of this to work, you have to know what it is that you want. And the problem with knowing what you want is that most people don't. Even you. You think you know what you want, but most of the time you don't. You have a vague idea. Um, most of the time we don't know what we want. Most of the time we are reactive. So we are reacting to what other people are doing, we're reacting to the outside world. We're not mostly thinking about our own goals, pursuing our own interests. We have a vague idea. We know what we like and what we don't like, but we tend not to think long term about what we want. Don't worry though, it's completely normal because our senses, our brains are all created to allow us to react to the world so that we can survive. So this is quite normal and it's something that we can understand and it's something that we can uh, that we can learn how to adapt to better. Let's start with some simple instructions for you. So if you're willing, if you're happy, I'd like you to play along uh, with the presentation from time to time. So I've got some instructions for you to follow. Look at this slide. Did you do that for me? I guess you did. Read these words or even listen to my voice. They're quite simple instructions, aren't they? They're very direct. They are only use three or four words, so they use the smallest amount of information to get the message across. Well, finish that report, that still only has three words, but I hope you notice that that's not quite the same kind of instruction, because when I say read these words or look at this slide, it's very simple. When I say finish that report, well, you don't really know what I mean by finish, 
and you don't really know what report I'm talking about. What about work harder? Or even something that um, when I used to work for, for BT, for British Telecom many years ago, something that uh, our senior managers used to say at BT was, be more professional. Which means what? Does that mean dress more smartly? Or charge more for your services? Uh, or get more certificates? What does it mean, be more professional? And how about this uh, this last one? Could you try to get that report finished soon, please? This is very common. We hear this a lot, in, in not just in business, but everywhere you go. You'll hear people giving each other instructions, but they'll be wrapped up to make them sound nice, to make them sound um, more pleasant, more friendly. Uh, could you try, would you mind getting that report finished if it's not too much trouble, if you're not too busy? And um, while we think we're communicating clearly and we're being uh, understanding that the other person might be busy, actually what we're communicating is very confusing. So the first thing we're going to look at is understanding how people interpret instructions and how people are different. Um, there are fundamentally two different ways that people see the world and this is created in our brains within the first few weeks of birth so by the time you were a few weeks old the fundamental way that you see the world and other people was fixed that doesn't mean your behavior and your attitudes are fixed because you can be open-minded you can learn and you can adapt um, but your your fundamental hardware that everything else is everything that else that you learn is built upon so it looks in one of two directions you either have an internal reference so people with an internal reference they're internally motivated they do things because it's what they know uh, it's the right thing to do uh, they have a, a, a sense of direction that comes from within and they evaluate new information by comparing it to what they've already experienced because if it's inside their head it must be true and if it's in the outside world then it must be uncertain at best these people they tend to hear instructions as suggestions so you think you've told them but actually they haven't heard you because their internal world is their point of reference their internal world is the constant and they compare your instruction to that constant. Some people have an external reference. They're externally motivated. They're more reactive. They're more, uh, they look to the outside world and to other people uh, for their sense of direction. So these people like to have data and information and certificates and instructions. Um, they're not passive. Um, they're not introverted or extroverted they're not quiet um, it bears no relation to that it only it, this is only relevant to how we evaluate new information so people with an external reference they tend to hear suggestions as instructions so you think you've only suggested something and they've already started doing it the external world is their reality the external world is their reference their constant and their internal experiences change to suit what's happening in the outside world. So people with an internal reference, they would say, so for example, if I had an internal reference and you were, let's say you were my manager and you were asking me to, to do something. But what I know is constant. What you're asking is variable. So I'll comply with your instruction if it agrees with what I already think. This is nothing to do with arrogance, this is nothing to do with ego or people thinking that they're always right or it's about who's right and who's wrong. It's about how people make decisions and how they weigh up new information. If I have an external reference then what you're asking me to do is constant and what I already know is variable. So I'll tend to comply with you regardless of what I already think. I hope you can see that when people are at the two extremes of this scale, it's equally dangerous. 
in an organization or in any situation really it's equally dangerous where you have people who just do what they think is right regardless of what anybody else is doing and it's equally dangerous to have people who do whatever suggested to them regardless of what they know to be right what we really want is for people to be in the middle of the scale to have adapted from their lifetimes experiences to be able to weigh up new information against what they already know and come up with a, a reasoned balanced decision about what course of action to take and these things as well they can be uh, influenced very much by things like authority uh, there's a very good book by uh, a guy called Robert Cialdini uh, called Influence Science and Practice where he explores how easily people are influenced by things like authority figures um, by uh, people who uh, use uh, the things that convince us um, the experiences that we've already had people giving us reasons for, for what they're doing um, that we uh, people that we like people who've done something for us we tend to want to do something in return for them so these are all factors as well but these factors are overlaid on this basic foundation that we're, we're pretty much born with. Now, have you ever had a discussion with somebody where you feel like you've walked in halfway through an argument? So maybe you walk into a room or maybe you, you say something to them and their reaction just seems totally out of proportion. So their reaction, maybe they get very angry uh, or, or they raise their voice or they seem very defensive or something like that. And you think you're confused because you feel like you've missed half of the argument. Well, actually, that's exactly what's happened. You have walked in halfway through the argument. It's just that the argument didn't happen in, um, in reality. The, the argument happened in their heads. They just let you in on the argument halfway through. This is what happens. You think about something that you want. So, for example, I mean, right now, think about something that you want to achieve today. Think about a goal that you have today. Chances are that goal involves other people. You need other people to do something for you or to help you with it or to give you some resources or some authority, something like that. So what you do is you imagine that they won't give it to you. So you imagine, um, let's say for example, you buy, uh, say you buy an, an, a new iPhone and there's something wrong with it. So you take it back to the shop. And as you're walking into the shop, you start to imagine the person on the desk disagreeing with you and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with the phone. It's your fault. You're, you're not using it properly. Uh, there's no problem with it. It's uh, you, you haven't configured it correctly or something like that. So you start to imagine this conversation. So, of course, you naturally imagine you, that you're standing up for yourself, that you're saying, no, no, I tried that already. It's definitely the phone that's, that's the problem. And I looked on Google and I asked a friend and it's definitely the phone's problem. Then you imagine the customer service person or the person behind the desk saying, no, 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 the phone's fine. It's definitely your fault you're stupid, you don't know how to use it, and you get yourself angry because you've had an argument with yourself. So by the time you get to the desk, you're so angry that you're thinking, I'm going to have to make them give me what I want. And so you maybe say things that you regret, or maybe you raise your voice, or you get a little bit angry, and they're confused because, of course, their job is to help you. And, and to figure out what the problem is and if you're using it wrong that's no problem they're complicated things they want to help you they want to help you and if there's a fault with it then it doesn't cause them any problem they just have to send it back to the manufacturer so they don't mind either way so what you've done is you've you've had an argument with yourself and then at the point at which you approach the desk you're so frustrated that you end up maybe using more force than, uh, than than is appropriate, more force than makes sense given the nature of the of the discussion. Of course the other thing that you can do, and this is very very common in the workplace, where it's harder for people to get angry at each other, there are social rules and, and etiquette that mean we 
try to be polite to each other at work. So you think about what you want, you imagine that the other person doesn't want to help you, that they won't give it to you. So you think, right, I'm going to have to make them give it to me. But instead of making them by force, you go the opposite way. You say, I don't suppose you could help me with this, could you? Or, or would you mind just... Uh, could you, would you mind just finishing this report by the end of the day if you're not too busy and if it's not too much trouble and if you're not too busy and if it's okay with you and the problem is what you've now done is confuse them the same thing has happened they've walked in halfway through uh, a discussion and this is very common you'll even see this in emails I guarantee if you look back through the last few days emails you'll find an example of this the example is where somebody starts a conversation or they start in an email with an apology so if they start with I'm sorry for bothering you again I'm sorry for asking so many questions uh, I'm sorry to take up your time uh, I'm, I'm sorry I know that you're busy what are they apologizing for you haven't said anything they haven't done anything to apologize for so if they apologize at the start of a conversation or the start of an email that tells you they already played out that conversation in their heads and you just came into it halfway through so we've got some reasons now why you don't get what you want you don't know what you want you're afraid to ask for what you want and so if you don't know what you want then you can't be clear and you can't be specific and concise when you ask for it if you're afraid to ask for what you want because you've already rehearsed how badly the conversation is going to go you've already rehearsed that the other person doesn't want to help you then you end up actually not asking for what you want and therefore it should be no surprise that the other person doesn't help you of course there'll be other reasons sometimes the other person doesn't have what you want they don't want you to have it they want to keep it what you're asking for just isn't possible there's nothing we can do about those today for this webinar we can only focus on the reasons that you can control and right now the only things that you can control are you and your behavior so let's start with what you want so I've said most people don't know what they want most people don't think about goals they maybe might write a to-do list and their to-do list might be activities but that's not goals that's not end results not outcomes so let's start by working out what you want and then you're in a better position to get it. Simple. You've probably heard of SMART goals. They won't help you. SMART goals are very common in business. Uh, they're very common as a way of communicating goals within teams or between teams. Um, SMART goals are, are okay, but they're not detailed enough to help you in this situation. They don't... Uh, they, you have to translate them too much uh, in order to know what to do, how to act to achieve the goal. So what we're going to look at instead is something called pure goals. Pure goals are, are interesting because they connect with the way that your brain orients your behavior towards your needs. So if there's something that you need, you don't even have to think about it. So for example, if you're thirsty, you don't have to have a project team, you don't have to have a review meeting and an in-depth analysis to work out what the nature of the problem is and what to do about it. If you're thirsty, you go and get a drink. You don't even have to think about it. You just go to the machine or the water fountain or whatever it might be, or to the kitchen, you get yourself a drink. It's no big deal. Something that you need and your brain orients you, points your behavior towards achieving that goal. So, for example, if your partner's birthday or your best friend's birthday is coming up, then you'll start to notice over the, the few days before, you'll start to notice things that remind you. You'll start to notice things that might be good presents for them or, or, or you know, you start to notice a, a shop that sells greeting cards, these sorts of things. You don't have to give it any thought. And it would be nice, wouldn't it, if you could achieve any goal just as easily. So that's what we're going to do. And here I'm going to ask you to play along again. If, you, um, if you'd like to answer these following questions, you can just answer them in your head. Uh, it will be better if you can write your answers down 
own if you happen to have a notepad and pen. But if not, you can just think your answers through, that's okay. Let's start with the obvious question, what do you want? Seems simple. But actually, what a lot of people will do is when you ask them what they want, they'll tell you what they don't want. This is not helpful at all. So the first thing that you have to do is check that the goal is positive. It's something that you want rather than something that you're trying to avoid. So for example, if your goal is to finish a piece of work by Friday, then that's positive. Uh, a negative goal would be you don't want to be late. You don't want to send it late. You don't want to get into trouble for sending the, uh, the piece of work in late. So to say it positively means you're talking about what you do want. The next question is, is it under your control? Quite often, uh, people will express a goal. For example, they'll say, um, let's say, for example, somebody's taking their driving test. And you ask them what their goal is, and they say their goal is to pass. That's not helpful, because passing is not under their control because they don't know what the driving conditions are going to be, they don't know what frame of mind the, the, the examiner or the instructor will be. Um, they could have an accident during the driving test that, that is not their fault at all, but they could fail because of it. Um, the instructor could be sick and the test doesn't happen at all, it's cancelled. And then they didn't pass their test, but they didn't do anything wrong either. So passing your driving test is not under your control. Going to the driving test centre and doing your best and taking time to prepare beforehand, these are under your control. Everything else, you have to just trust that uh, that it will work in your favour or at least not, uh, not against you. The next thing you have to check is that it's real. This sounds like a, a strange question because of course why would we ask for goals that aren't real. Well, for example, I asked you, I gave you an instruction earlier, which was uh, work harder. It's positive, work harder. It's under your control, you can work harder. But what does it look like? What does working harder look like? Does it just mean staying in the office late? Do you picture yourself sitting at a desk, stressed or, or worrying? Uh, what does it sound like? What does working harder sound like? Does it sound like a busy office environment? Or does it sound quiet? Because when you work harder, when you're more productive, is when you find some quiet space to work in. And what does it feel like? Does it feel stressful? Does it feel productive? Does it feel purposeful? Does it feel good? Does it not feel good? So what we mean by real is it's represented, or we can think about it, in terms of our basic senses, we can see it, we can hear it, and we can feel it. The last thing is the ecology check. Ecology means balance. It means that there are no unplanned side effects or negatives. Um, quite often we'll, we'll pursue a goal without thinking that it's not all good. There is, might be some bad things that happen. So a typical example might be somebody uh, is working really hard to get a promotion in their career but actually uh, there are some downsides to getting a promotion you could probably imagine what those downsides might be they might be things like um, you have to work harder you have to work longer hours you have higher expectations more stress you spend less time with your family and is all of that worth the extra money and the extra responsibility the issue is that while there are good aspects of the goal and also bad aspects of the goal, what will happen is you'll sabotage it yourself. You'll see a job and you think, oh, that's really perfect, but you'll forget to apply for it until after the deadline's gone. Because what you're doing is you're stopping yourself from suffering from the, the negative side effects of the goal. So here's what I'd like you to do. Take your goal that you're thinking of, what it is that you want, and imagine that I could give it to you right now. Imagine that I'm holding my hand out in front of you, and in my hand is that goal, and it's what you see and what you hear and what you feel when you've achieved it. If I was to offer you to that right now, will you take it? 
Now, when I asked you that question, if you were thinking of a goal, then one of two things happened. Either you had a com you had a sense of of a complete yes. It's like your whole body and your whole mind said yes. That's what I want, and uh, and you wanted to to grab it, and and it's definitely what you want. The other thing that happens is that you got a mixed reaction. So it was like you wanted to say yes, but part of you wasn't sure. And what happens when when people have these mixed feelings is you ask them if they can do something for you, and they say, "Yeah, I, I can, I can try." That mixed reaction is a no, because it will prevent you from achieving the goal. If you get a mixed reaction, then go back to the start, ask yourself again, is it positive? Probably is. Is it under your control? Might not be. You might have, um, you might have, have, have chosen a goal that isn't completely under your control, so you can't put all of your effort into achieving it. It may be that you couldn't clearly see or hear or feel what it's like to achieve that goal. So when we get to the final bit, the ecology check, and if I was to offer it to you, would you take it? You get that mixed reaction because uh, because the goal isn't completely valuable or 100% right for you. And so you go back and you fine tune and you adjust the goal until you get a definite yes. So that's great. Now what? So you've set a goal for yourself, but so what? you've got your goal. The next thing that we need to do is we need to place it in time. Now if you just think in terms of the ecology check from that pure goal setting process, the next time you ask somebody to do something for you, if they say yes, then you can be confident that they're going to do what you've asked, or at least what they've understood that you've asked. Whereas if they say, yeah, I'll, I'll try, what generally happens is you hear that as a yes, because yes is what you want to hear. But what they actually said was no. And you need to treat it as if they've said no. We'll come back to that later on. So we place a goal in time. Which of these two statements seems more real to you? I will finish this report by five o'clock today. Or... By the time I leave the office to go home today, I will have finished this report. Which one just seems more real? I'm going to guess it's the one on the right. And there's a reason for that. Time doesn't exist. Past and future don't exist. Because your brain only understands what's happening now. Anything that isn't happening right now is a memory. So do you remember me talking about expectations and how you walk into an argument halfway through because somebody's already wound themselves up? It's a memory. Do you remember me talking about uh, how you can negotiate with somebody once you've heard their yes as a no and you can negotiate with them so that they uh, comply with your request? No, because we haven't talked about that yet. So your brain only understands what's happening now. Everything else, past and future, are memories. But they're different kinds of memories. A memory of what we call the past came in through our external senses. A memory of what we call the future came in through our internal senses. We imagined it internally. Which seems more certain to you, past or future? And I'm going to guess you that you just said past. So what we do is we place a goal that in reality is in the future. So it's something that we want to complete by the end of this week. But what we actually do is we phrase it so that it's in the past. It automatically becomes more certain. So what, you, what you're going to do is you're going to imagine that it's the deadline for your goal now. And you're looking back at what you did to achieve the goal. We'll come on to an example of this because this is great for your own goals. But remember, the subject of the seminar is why don't people just do what you ask? 
So what we need to do now is we need to take what we've learned about setting goals for ourselves and now we need to put that into a language that we can communicate to other people so that they do what we want and they help us to achieve our goals. So here's two examples that you could say to somebody else. You could say, I need you to finish this report by five o'clock today. And they'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Or you could move it forward in time and say, by the time you leave the office to go home today, I need you to have finished this report. And they're more likely to comply with the second statement because of the way that it's phrased in time. And what we do is we take the language and we convert it back into something that we can see, hear and feel in our brains. And we put it in the place in our brains where memories are of the past, which are more certain. So this is why we feel more certain about goals when we talk about them as if they are things that have already happened. And this is a very simple thing to do. If you're talking about a very complex project and you're talking about, let's say, a project that will last six months, if we stand here today talking about a project that's uh, a project deadline that's six months away, it seems very uncertain. A lot can happen in six months. We don't know what might change. We don't know what problems we might have. So instead, if you start by saying, imagine it's now, uh, what would it be, November, imagine it's now November the 12th, and we finished the project, looking back, what were the things, the most important things that we had to do to achieve it? What you're doing by taking that approach is you're giving people more certainty and therefore more confidence in what they're going to do, and because they're more confident, they're more likely to do it. When we give people instructions, we phrase them in two halves. We actually give people two instructions in one most of the time. And what we do is we give them a condition and an instruction. So if this happens, then do that. And straight away, as soon as I word it like that, if this, the if, is uncertain, we don't know whether this is going to happen or not. Do that becomes certain only when the condition is met. So if it's raining, I'll take the car. If I'm busy and I think I might be late, I'll take the train. I need you to finish this report by five o'clock today. That's the way most people phrase this statement. Because what we do when we're giving somebody else an instruction is we focus on what we want them to do. I need you to finish this report. But when they listen to it, what they do is they put that statement in the condition part that becomes the test or the variable. So they're already debating whether they can finish the report for you or not, or whether they even want to do it or not, before you've said do that, before you've said by five o'clock today. People listen much faster than you can talk. So by the time you're halfway through your instruction, they've already figured out why they can't do it or why they've got a problem with it or why they're too busy to help. They've already started disagreeing with you before you've even finished speaking. So they'll start thinking, oh, I'm not sure I can finish that. I don't know what he means by report. What does he mean by finish? How much work's involved? What do I have to do? What else have I got to do today? Too many variables, it's confusing. So they're already closing down. So by the time you say by five o'clock today, all of those variables then become, well, I can't do that. If you're lucky, they'll say, no, sorry, I can't help, because then you can negotiate. Most of the time they'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll try, and then they won't. So if we know that the way we listen is to listen for the condition, then the instruction, if this, do that, why don't we swap our instructions around and see what happens? By five o'clock today, oh, yeah, five o'clock today. I know when that is. I feel confident that there will be a five o'clock today. So now I'm open-minded. Yes, I'm waiting for what you're going to say next. I need you to finish this report. Ah, huh, okay, why not? So when we 
switch the two statements in the instruction around, which isn't how most people are used to saying it, but if we switch it around, what we do is we keep the listener open-minded until they've heard the complete instruction. And then they're more likely to be agreeable because they're weighing up the facts and they're making a decision and they're doing exactly what we want them to do. We talked earlier about expectations. The problem with expectations is we think we know what other people are thinking. I know what you're thinking right now. And you know that I don't. You think, oh, you don't know what I'm thinking. When you expect or where you preempt what other people are thinking, where you try to second guess or you try to to plan uh, a conversation, what you're actually trying to do is control the outcome. You're actually trying to control the other person. Because your assumption is, if you just ask, they'll say no. So I'll have to say something that will make them say yes. That doesn't work. So if you say to somebody, by the end of this week, I need a project update from you. This is the format I'm looking for. If anything gets in the way, I expect you to tell me. Do you agree? This is a, this is a, a well-worded instruction. I'm telling you what I need. I'm telling you how I want it to look. I don't want to wait till Friday and then you come to me and say, yeah, the project's going fine. It's an update. It's not quite what I had in mind. So this is the format I'm looking for. And I'm giving you an exception rule, which is if anything gets in the way, I expect you to tell me. I don't want to wait till Friday and say, where's that project update? Ah, oh, well, I couldn't do it because I was busy and this thing came up and then, you know, Joe was off set and I had to do that and then there was the, and then it was raining and, and all sorts of different reasons. And then I ask you to agree with me. Do you agree? People don't follow your instructions at work, at home. They don't follow your instructions because you're powerful. They don't follow your instructions because they have to. This isn't the army. People follow your instructions because they agree to. So when you ask for that agreement, what you'll get is, okay, I can do that. I can do what you've asked. Or you'll get, an, I can't do that. Think back to what we talked about with the pure goals and the ecology check. When you say, do you agree? And they say, yes, that's fine. That's, what, that's a good thing. When, they, when you say, do you agree, and they say, well, I'll try, then you can act as if they said, no, sorry, I can't do that. If they're honest with you, which is what we really want, we really want people to be honest with each other, then they'll say, I can't do that. What most people will then say is, why? We think that when we ask the question why, we get reasons. We don't. We get justification applications. We don't get the reasons why somebody chose to do something. What we get is the noise that they make to stop you from asking them why they did something. Because generally people don't know why they do things. So you say, why can't you do that? Oh, important reasons, noise stuff, things, impossible problems, things that I can't do anything about. It's not my fault. Get off my back and leave me alone and you're asking too much and I'm under pressure and, and I've got all these other things to do. And so you say, okay, I'll do it then. And they're very happy with that because now that's one less piece of work for them to do. So the question you must never ask is why. It's not helpful. So you give somebody instruction, they are honest with you and say, I can't do that. Instead, you say thank you. So you acknowledge the fact that they've been straight with you. And when you acknowledge things, people do more of what you give them attention for. So when you acknowledge the fact that somebody's been straight with you, they'll do it more often. What can I do to help? Now, what you'll notice is the difference between this example and the last one. Is in the last one, when you ask why, you assume that all of the reasons they gave you were true. So assume that they can't do what you've asked and therefore you have to find an alternative. So they become a constant, you become the variable. When you say, what can I do to help? You're assuming 
that your instruction is the constant and their refusal is the variable. So what you're thinking is, okay, based on the information I've given you, or based on the resources that you have, you can't do what I've asked. That's fine. So how can I help you by changing the instruction or by making some resources available? So what can I do to help? Well, you could get someone to help me. So now you have the only objection, the only thing that's going to stop them from doing what you've asked. So if I get Joe to help you tomorrow, you'll do what I've asked. Okay. There we go. So we've been able to have a negotiation. They've been able to give you a genuine reason why they're not going to do what you've asked them to do. And you've been able to negotiate with them and achieve a result. So, in summary, we were going to talk about understanding how people interpret instructions. The time has flown, hasn't it? It's really gone quickly. Learn how to package your instructions so they're easier to follow and use your communication skills to get the results what you want. And specifically, what we covered in those areas were, we talked about people having an internal and external reference and how they hear instructions differently. So the internal people, they compare your instruction to their internal benchmark. And the externally referenced people, your suggestion becomes their internal benchmark. We've talked about how you package your instructions to make them easier to follow. So we can say that your instructions should be direct and clear and concise. Read these words, listen to my voice, look at this slide. That's obvious. The important thing is you don't have any expectations about whether the other person is going to say yes or no. And you phrase your um, your instruction so that the condition, understanding that the condition comes first, the instruction is second. So if you know that the other person is going to hear whatever you say as if, then, then you put the thing that you really want to happen or the thing that will definitely happen first. So finishing a report, uh, giving a project update, um, installing some software, whatever it might be. These are all possible. They might happen, they might not. But five o'clock today, that will definitely happen. Next weekend will definitely happen. When you come into work tomorrow morning, that will definitely happen. You know it will happen because you can remember it happening before. So you have certainty about that. So if we put what we want to happen, the uh, the in the um, in the second part of the statement instead of the first part where we normally put it then what we're doing was we're increasing people's certainty and confidence in performing that task for you and we talked about communication stills so basically stop predicting and controlling stop trying to second guess what other people are going to do it isn't your responsibility to decide if the other person can perform the task, if they can do what you ask. It's not your responsibility. It's only your responsibility to ask them to do it. It's their responsibility to say if they can do it or not. Because then you can work together to achieve the result that you want. So be clear on what you want. Remember, when you set a goal, positive, it's under your control, it's real, so you can see here and feel what it is, and you've done the ecology test, and when you've done that, you can phrase that goal, you can give that goal to somebody else. This is what I'm asking you to do. Um, this is what the end result is going to look and sound and feel like. And I'd like you to do it by 5 o'clock Friday. Do you agree? So, for example, um, if you've enjoyed the webinar, then that's the condition. So if you've enjoyed the webinar and you found it useful, then... You can send an email to the organisers at the Medina Institute, tell them how wonderful it was and that you'd love to see me in Saudi Arabia delivering a, a live seminar that you'd love to go to. That would be wonderful. But if I switch those to, uh, if, if I change the, the order of the instruction, by the time that we finish this webinar and you go back to whatever you're going to do next, you can already think about the email that you're going to send to the organisers saying how much you'd like uh, you'd like to see uh, the presenter Peter Freeth over in Saudi Arabia delivering a, a live seminar in the future. And that would be wonderful. So, we're open for questions, I believe. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for a very interesting presentation. 
Folks, we are open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, you can either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the console, so if you raise your hand, you can speak to Mr. Peter Free. So let me go straight to the first caller, rather one of our regular callers. We have Dr. Rishad Faridi. Doctor, please introduce and ask the question, sir. Hello, hi, Peter. I'm a professor here in Kingdom Saudi Arabia and, and the University College Prince Saddam bin Abdulaziz University in Al-Khurj. And thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my uh, thing process is that, uh, especially in today's business, uh, like if we can have, uh, instead of having, uh, avoiding conflicts and uh, uh, meeting your expectations of the, between the boss and the pair, if we can more kind of having some crash courses on some keywords like the concern and then the, a high degree of sympathy and further higher seriousness of empathy and and more of compassionate. If we are creating that compassionate culture of business, I'm sure that a uh, lot of uh, conflicts and uh, that it will be having more authentic, authenticity and it will be more originality will be there instead of a more instructions and more directions there. So what I think is is it's the business more should be focused for being in customer centric. They need to be more compassionate in in terms so that they can get a high engagement with the employees. So uh, being into a long uh, time, Peter, into your experience, uh, a diversity with a lot of organization. So what, what you comment on that? Uh, I think it's a very good point. I think that uh, definitely empathy and understanding um, is really the key to resolving any conflict, any problem. A conflict arises because we have different uh, views, we have different opinions, different needs, uh, or there are limited resources and we're trying to do too many different things with them uh, and we can't do everything. So uh, conflict is, is normal. Uh, within a, a productive team, we actually have a high degree of healthy conflict. People do debate openly and honestly, uh, and they're not afraid of confrontation, uh, because actually what they understand is everyone wants to work together to the common interest, which could be the customer, it could be for the business, it could be for the good of the, the staff and the employees, but we all understand what the common goal is. And there's a great risk actually involved in what you're talking about, a personal risk, which is we have to be honest with each other. And the risk of being honest is that the other person might say something I don't like. And that's the risk that we take and therefore that's the reason why we have these expectations and these, these conversations in our heads that we, uh, uh, that, that we then play out before we get into the conversation in real life. And the risk that, that we can take is rather than predicting what the other person is going to say or trying to predict, we just say what, what it is we want, express what our needs are, what our beliefs are, and then we're open to the possibility that the other person will disagree with them. And if they do, that's fine. And if they agree with us, that's fine too. The important thing is, either way, we make progress together. Uh, we make progress because we work together, because we both understand that we have a, a common goal, and nobody has all the answers. Nobody has all of the knowledge, all of the information. And actually, when we uh, when we collaborate, then we are far far more effective than we ever will be individually. Sometimes we get more work done individually. Sometimes, if you work from home for the morning and it's nice and quiet, you get more work done because there are fewer distractions. But that's not about conflict. That's just about um, kind of focus and time management, really. So I definitely agree that that empathy, that understanding. It is very, very important, and that it's not just about giving instructions. And really, the, in the webinar, I don't want to give the impression that, that instructions is about telling people what to do. It's about clearly expressing your needs, and then other people can can agree or disagree with those. Um, but together, you can negotiate and, and work out how to achieve some task that you both agree is important. So thank you for the question. Yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Ali, for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, question. Uh, now let me move to the question box. We have a question from Mr. Tony Moorcroft. The question is, hi, Peter. Tony Moorcroft here. 
brilliant content as usual. I often rehearse how something will go before it happens, and this is based on how things have gone before, and, and I can bring, bring myself up to the point it feels real to me. The actual experience is often completely different, and I end up looking like a fool. I tell myself I learn from it, but I still do it. Any tips for stopping this? Uh, I think I wouldn't give a, it's a, it's a. It's an interesting question. It's a very good question. Thank you, Tony. Um, I wouldn't advise stopping it. That may sound like a strange answer. Let me tell you why. You probably know that sports professionals mentally rehearse. Um, so, for example, a racing driver will mentally rehearse the track. And there's a reason for this. It's so that when they're actually in the race, they don't have to think about where to turn. All they have to worry about is what the other drivers are doing. So they mentally rehearse the track because other than the weather conditions changing, the track isn't going to change. There aren't going to be any extra turns that weren't there when they rehearsed it. If they were to mentally rehearse what the other drivers were doing, that would be a big mistake because they don't know what the other drivers are going to do. And often the other drivers will act only in reaction to each other. So that's very unpredictable. So it's good to mentally rehearse the things that you know are under your control. So for example, if you're going to deliver a presentation, you want it to go well, of course you do, but what do you mean by going well? You want to be articulate and remember what you were going to say, stick to time, um, you know, work your, your, your presentation uh, effectively. These are all things that you can do whether there's anybody watching you or not. So that's good. That's good to mentally rehearse that. It isn't useful when you put the audience in the mental rehearsal and you make your goal uh, or you know, your measure of a, a good presentation is dependent on the audience. So your measure of a good presentation becomes uh, I want the, 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 my presentation to be well received or I want it to be liked or I want the audience to agree with me because you can't control that. Um, so it's good that you have this ability to mentally rehearse. We all have that. It's very important. Uh, because our lives depend on us being able to predict the future. So that's useful. But use it for things that you know aren't going to change as a result of other people's actions. So use it only for things that are under your control. And, uh, and if you find yourself putting other people into it, like an audience for a presentation, it's okay, but don't have them, don't be dependent on what they're doing. Don't have them asking you questions or smiling or clapping or saying, whoa, Tony, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. Uh, I'm sure they will say that, but it's not under your control. What is under your control is that uh, you plan and you prepare and you do the best that you can. And if they don't like it, that's okay. That's, that's entirely up to them. And you, you can be pleased that they've been honest enough to express their opinion. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Tony. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Badr Fayaz. I'll uh, say, Harry, the question is, thank you, Peter, for the great content of your presentation. Is it usually not recommended to ask why in order to keep the instruction constant? Isn't it why it tells you more about why the employees behave that way? Yeah, it's a good question. This is we are we're brought up we we you know we learn English or we learn whatever our native language is, thinking that when we ask why we get reasons, and what happens is we apply that to physical things as a child. Why is the sky blue? And our parents might say, well, water in the atmosphere scatters the sun's light, and because of the size of the water droplets, it absorbs all the colours except for blue, and then the sky looks blue. And this is a nice explanation, and it's a reason why, because the reason why doesn't change from one day to the next. The problem is, when we apply that same rational, logical thinking to people's behavior, because people don't behave the same every day. So if you ask somebody why they did something, it's very rare that they can tell you. Uh, there's some recent uh, research being done on this in, in neuroscience uh, that... Um, that, that's looked at people making decisions and looked at activity in their brains in real time. And what happens is uh, people will start to take action 
around about half a second before they think they've made the decision. So what happens is our conscious mind, our awareness, is uh, comes after the decision's already made. And so if you ask somebody why they did something, they won't be able to tell you why they did it. What they will give you is justifications to explain why, not why they did it, but why it was okay for them to do it. So if somebody, uh, if you say to somebody, I asked you to give me a project update, where is it? Uh, well, I couldn't, it was busy, I was busy, and, uh, and, it, uh, and, it, and you, 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 you didn't ask me properly anyway, and it's your fault, and, you know, so when you ask why, you get excuses, you don't get reasons. And actually, the reasons are irrelevant anyway, because they happened in the past. If what your focus is, is on how can you get the job done, it really doesn't matter why somebody hasn't done it. All that matters is it isn't done yet. So what our focus should be on is not worrying about why they didn't do it, but how do we get them to do it now? So, okay, so uh, I asked you to give me the project update. You've not done it yet. That's okay. Um, what do we need to do? How can I help you with this? Um, what you're saying is this isn't going anywhere. I'm not taking the task off you. I'm still expecting you to do what I've asked, but I'm prepared to help you to do it to make it easier for you. So uh, I hope that answers the the question. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another one, a short one. Does moving or adjusting the words in written instructions equally help in controlling the outcome? Oh, that's a great question. Definitely. Absolutely. What's a very common thing, this is very common in emails. Somebody will write an email and they'll put three or four questions in the email. And when they get the reply, there's only one reply. People will generally, if you send them three or four questions in an email, or if you give them three or four questions in a conversation, they will tend to only answer the last question or they will tend to only respond to the last instruction. So definitely if you make your, uh, like with the instructions, read these words, look at this slide. The fewer words that you use, uh, the easier it is for them to understand what you're asking of them. And if you are asking uh, for help or you're asking questions or you're giving instructions in an email, then it, this may seem a bit odd, but ask one question per email and one question at a time because otherwise you won't get answers to all of the all of the questions that you've asked or uh, to all of the the instructions that you've given so yeah that's a, that's a great question definitely important to to keep it as short as possible okay thank you we have a supplementary from brother Sihari. the question is do, doesn't this has to do more with linguistics how does the brain respond to it? In general, does semantics plays a role there? Uh, definitely. We, when we're, we're born, one of the things that we start to do from when we're a few months old is we start to label the world and we want to know what things are called. If any of you have young children, um, then one of the things that young children do is they ask what, what things are called, what, what their names are. Um, so both in, in terms of language and, and semantics, which is about structure and rules, um, what we're really talking about is our brain's labeling system for the world. So we'll take something that's very physical and concrete, like a glass of water or a table or a computer, and then we will um, we'll turn that into something abstract, thirsty, work, uh, busy. And if we can reduce our instructions to simpler, more physical, more concrete terms, then it's easier for the brain to understand. Uh, children don't develop the ability to think in terms of abstract concepts and abstract labels until they're round about 10 years old, something like that, uh, when the brain starts to separate from the physical concrete world and to create its own inner internal experience. So 
whatever the method we use, whether we're talking linguistics, semantics, anything else, um, what we're really talking about is the brain's labeling system, the way that the brain creates an abstract model of the world. Um, and that's where in, that's where the gap is created. When we say something like to somebody like be more professional, that's where the gap uh, that causes problems, uh, um, that's where the interpretation is. Because in order for me to understand what you mean by be more professional, I have to turn that into something that I can see and hear and feel. And I might picture myself in a more expensive suit, um, and that is my interpretation of being more professional. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question, and, and it's really independent of language, um, because it, uh, the, 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 the underlying structure that our brain has that we build language on top of is common for everybody in the world. Um, there was a book written back in the 90s, I think, called The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. Uh, where what they've they've discovered is that every language everywhere in the world, even in remote rainforests that have had no prior contact with any outsiders, all languages have are based on the same underlying structure, and that structure is the way that we encode memories in our brains. So yeah, very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Freed, for a very interesting presentation and for your time. I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Mark, any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody who's attended and, and, and the few of you that are still left and, and listening to the questions. If you have any further questions or of course if there's anything that I can do to help then I think you can probably contact it, uh, me via the, um, uh, via the, the, the MILE website or through, through the organizers. Um, you can look me up on LinkedIn and Facebook as well, Peter Freeth. Uh, and you'll you'll find me there. So I'll be delighted to connect with any of you. Uh, delighted to any ask uh, to answer any other questions that you might have. And just thank you again for for your time and uh, and and good luck. Good luck. Well, once again, thank you very much indeed. And uh, folks, so we are recording this webinar, which will be uploaded in the next couple of days on my community. It's community .org. Also, please stay tuned to webinar .org for our upcoming webinars. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Peter Freed, and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for you. Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE.